is an authority on 13 countries you have probably never heard of. What is your name, please? My name is John Sack. What is your name, please? My name is John Sack. What is your name, please? My name is John Sack. Two of these people are imposters. Only one is the real John Sack and is the only one sworn to tell the truth. Now, here is our host, Bud Collier. Thank you very much, and welcome once again to To Tell the Truth. Now, may I introduce our panel. What is your name, please? My name is Betty White. My name is Ralph Bellamy. My name is Kitty Carlisle. My name is Tom Poston. I'd like to take just a moment to thank very warmly my good friend Sonny Fox, who kept things dinging around here very nicely for you, I understand, the last two weeks. Without his assistance, I couldn't have gotten away for the two weeks vacation that I did have, and it was wonderful. Thank you, Sonny. Now, panel, let's go right to your copies of this first affidavit, and I'll read from mine. I, John Sack, am an author. My most recent book, published last week, is titled Report from Practically Nowhere and is an account of my journey to 13 countries whose importance can hardly be underestimated. In addition to well-known places like Liechtenstein, Andorra, San Marino, and Monaco, I also have visited countries which nobody ever goes to and most people have never even heard of. Countries like Lundy, which is ruled by a king named Mr. Harmon. Athos, whose inhabitants are all men. The S-M-O-M, which is only one half acre in size and Puniao, whose only claim to fame is the fact that it grows 100 different varieties of apricots. In addition to these fascinating places, I have also written extensively about the countries of Sark, Sikkim, Sharjah, Amb, and Swat. Signed, John Sack. So we start off tonight's panel with three gentlemen all claim to be John Sack, author of Report from Practically Nowhere. Let's start tonight with <laughs> Betty White. Thank you, Bud. Uh, number three, how come there are only men in Arthos? They're monks. Uh, hmm? Oh, they're what? Monks. They're all monks. <laughs> that answers my question, and I'm going to leave it right there, believe me. <laughs> number one, what does S-M-O-M stand for? Sovereign and Military Order of St. John of Jerusalem, Rhodes, and Malta. N no, <laughs> number two, what is the population of, of the, the sub, of S.A.O.M.? There are two, there are two people there now. There really are three, but one is dead. <laughs> you can have three legally. Are they, uh, boys and girls, or just boys? No, they're all men, too. I see. But only one lives in, the other one lives out. How do you find it? <laughs> <laughs> one lives out. <laughs> Ralph Bellamy. Um, number one. One of the principal industries of uh, Sark, Sikkim, Sarja, Amb, and Swat. <laughs> well, um, well, which one there? All of them. All, all of, them. of them. All right, take them in order. Sark. Sark, uh, well, they don't have much industries. Uh, Amb doesn't either. Everybody is so hot, they uh, sit in the river all the time trying to cool off. Liechtenstein makes... No, that was my like no. to say. Sikkim, Sikkim. They're making scotch now. Scotch. <laughs> what about Sharjah and Swat? Sharjah grows a lot of fish, and uh, Swat makes honey. Uh -huh. All right, number one again. Um, were you on a midnight to 5.30 radio program recently? That's right, yeah. What was the name of the program? Uh, the the uh, Long John Show. Long John. Number two, uh, were you on this program? That's right, yeah. Who was on with you? Oh, there were a collection of people. There was, uh... Oh, just name Hilton? a couple of names. I don't know their names. Kitty Carlisle. <laughs> Number one, what's the family na name of Sark Dane? Mrs. Hathaway. Hathaway Mrs. family. Hathaway. Uh, number two, <laughs> where is Sikkim, where they make the Scots? <laughs> well, that's between, uh... It's, well, first of all, it, it's northeast of Swat, uh, to begin with. But it's, um... Uh, it's south of Tibet, uh... east of Nepal, and be west of, uh... Khartoum. Thank you very much. <laughs> Number three, where, what's the population of Lundy? Twelve. Who are they? 
12 people. <laughs> What's the, who are the population of Lundy, number one? Well, there's the king. Uh, that's Mr. Harmon. And uh, Mr. Gade, Mrs. Gade. And there's a girl who uh, collects birds. And a few lighthouse keepers. I'd come about 12. <laughs> Tom Post, please. Uh, number three, I see SWAT. Is one of, was Babe Ruth ever the Sultan of Swat? <laughs> uh, only in America. <laughs> what is the Sultan of Swat's name? He's the Wally of Swat. Wally Ruth. <laughs> Wonderful name. <laughs> Ball player. Number two, where is uh, the SMOM? SOM, it's in downtown Rome. It's next to a haberdashery shop. But it's a private country? That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> On that note, it's time to vote. And without consultation, panel, will you please mark your ballots and in so doing, select number one, number two, or number three. Remember, please, the team of challengers will get $250 for every incorrect vote. Okay, all set, panel? Betty, for whom did you vote? Well, number one sounded so much like the one that I think it's number three, because you're pretty sneaky around here. And what about you, Ralph? Number one. He had a glint in his eye that seemed to indicate a certain amount of humor, which I think was attached with this book. And I did hear a little bit of him on, um, if he's the right man, I think he is, on Long John's program the other night. You stay up late, don't you? Once in a while. <laughs> I get home late. Boy, with it acting in Sunrise at Campobello and getting home late and staying up late, you better watch it, Ralph. Yeah. <laughs> Kitty? I voted for number one. Number three didn't know who, who was on Lundy. There were few enough of them to know. And I think it is Hathaway the Sark Dame's family name. And Tom Poston, your choice. I voted for number three, obviously because I'm not as smart as Kitty. <laughs> and I wasn't listening, but I'm just about as smart as Betty, so I guess we'll be all right. <laughs> all right, there you have it, and our minds are sort of made up. We'll discover now which one of these three gentlemen is the real John Sack, author of Report from Practically Nowhere. So, may I ask the real John Sack to please stand up. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Number two, would you tell us who you really are and what yes, you do? Yes, I'm Lee Perkins, radio officer on the SS Momax Star, running to South America for Momo Comic Lines. Thank you, sir. Number three, what about you, sir? I'm Dr. Robert Abel from Elizabeth, New Jersey. <laughs> well, there you have it. In checking over the voting, we find there were two incorrect votes at $250 each for a total of $500 from Marlboro. Gentlemen, thank you ever so much. On the way out, you will find a carton of Marlboro cigarettes for each of you. Good night and good luck. Now, panel, let's meet our next team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Mrs. Bob Dover. What is your name, please? My name is Mrs. Bob Dover. What is your name, please? My name is Mrs. Bob Dover. All right, panel, once again, would you direct your attention to your copies of this affidavit? I, Mrs. Bob Dover, was born in a circus wagon. My mother and father were aerialists, and I have been a circus performer all my life. I am now with Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. Currently, I perform as a bareback rider and also work in a juggling act. In past years, I have worked on the balancing ladder and on the flying trapeze. Signed, Mrs. Bob Dover. All right, panel, three lovely ladies, all claiming to be Mrs. Bob Dover, circus performer. Let's start this round of questioning with Ralph Bellamy. Ralph? Number one, you seem to have an accent. What country are you from? I am from Germany. Germany. Number two, where are you from? From Italy. Italy. Number three, where are you from? Hungary. <laughs> That's a lot of help. Number one, where are the uh, Ringling Brothers winter quarters? In Sarasota, Florida. Uh, number two... What is the uh, meaning of and the origin of tan bark? Tan bark. I don't understand the question. 
Can bark. Tan. The expression bark. can bark. Number three, can you answer that question? Uh, the can bark is the sawdust on the grounds, on the rinks. And uh, what's the origin of it? Uh, that I number don't one, know. do you know? I would not know, no. Um, number you one. You could tell Who, me. I beg pardon? You could tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me, who's the, who's the public relations man for Ringling Brothers? The public... Uh, public relations, press man. Oh, I, ca I can't think of Number that now. Kitty Carlisle. Number one, who... You all have it. are so pretty and have such beautiful legs, it's hard to choose. Number one, who was Lillian Leitzel? Lillian? Leitzel. Leitzel. I can't remember the name. Number Lillian. two, do you know who Grimaldi was? No, I don't. Uh, number three, Mrs. Bob Dober, number three. Uh, who is Mr. Bob Dober? He's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who, what does he do? Oh, he's a personal director at Ringling Brothers. Oh, I see. Number one, can you tell me what famous singer Mr. Barnum brought to this country? Beg what you famous point. singer? What famous singer? Barnum brought. Do you know number two? He has nothing. Tom Poston. Uh, number two, I see here that you do a bareback riding act. Do you work alone? Yes, I know. No horse. There must be sensational. <laughs> Pretty good trick, Tom. <laughs> uh, number one, could you describe your balancing ladder routine? Uh, yes, um, I walk, um, I step up on the ladder with no support. I take the lighter and I step up, it is about eight foot high. And uh, when I get on top, I juggle. I do that with my brother. He is on the other ladder. But he's not very good, so he gives you no support. <laughs> well, we both have, have no support. Oh, you both have no support. That, that is the balancing on the ladder. <laughs> Betty White. Thank you, bud. Number two, uh, your mother and father were aerialists, and you were born in a wagon. You're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> It's not applause you hear, that's the stork flying. <laughs> <laughs> what was this, number two? It was in Italy. It was in Italy, yes. Whereabouts in Italy? Uh, Milan. In Milan. Uh, number three, when do you open in New York? Pardon me? When do you open in New York with the circus? We're opening on uh, the 27th of March. And number one, what day of the week does that fall on? 27th of May. I don't know, I have not looked calendar. That's it, panel. Time once again to vote. And without consultation, will you kindly mark your ballots again and select as you did before number one, number two, or number three. All marked? Oh, you're fast tonight. Betty, for whom did you vote this time? Gee, I just switched courses right at that very last. <laughs> I was all set for number three, but I think May 27th is the proper date. I'm going to go for number one. Okay, Ralph, what about your vote? Very same reason, that last-minute switch. Okay. Well, I'm voting for number three because number one is German and didn't know Lillian Leitzel, and number two is Italian and didn't know Grimaldi, so I'm uh, left with number three. And what about your vote, Tom? Oh, that makes me stupid again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yes. I voted, for, I voted for number two, but I, I'm the only one that's that dumb. I, guess. <laughs> I tell you, the last minute switch in the dates convinced me that neither one of them knew. <laughs> Okay, there we have it. <clears throat> Votes in and minds made up. We'll discover now just how dumb Tom Poston is as we <laughs> discover which one of these ladies is the real Mrs. Dover. I'm going to ask all of these ladies, if they will, to please step up now and come in front of their desks as we discover which one of them is the real Mrs. Bob Dover, circus girl. Thank you very much. 
These lights here, believe me, when you stare into them and try to watch things like that, they blind you enough so you can't even see your own hands working. It's a little different than working where you usually do. Thank you so much. Number one, tell us who you really are and what you do. My name is Hedy Harms. I work for Associated Aviation Underwriters. I sell flight insurance at the East Side Airlines, at the Central Airlines building on 42nd Street. And number three, what about you? My name is <clears throat> Lila Cass, and I study acting. And at the present, I work as a waitress at the Gaslight Club. Thank you. Fun with that one, I'll tell you. And uh, they, the panel didn't do too well. When you check up on the score, we discovered that there was only one that picked our pretty number two as the real one. So that means three incorrect votes at $250 each for a fact. <laughs> Still feel dumb, Tom? The dumbest reason possible. Huh? <laughs> what was the reason, Tom? I uh, can't tell you now, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right, $750 for you ladies from Marlboro. And on your way out, you'll find a car at the Marlboro Cigarettes for each of you. Hope you had fun visiting us. We certainly enjoyed the show. And uh, we'll come and see you in the circus, young lady. Good night and good luck. <laughs> now, panel, let's meet our third team of challengers. Is your name, please? My name is James Edward Obanoff. What is your name, please? My name is James Edward Obanoff. What is your name, please? My name is James Edward Obanoff. All right, panel again. Will you follow along with your copies of the affidavit? I, James Edward Obanoff, am a lieutenant in the United States Air Force. About ten months ago, I was flying co-pilot in a B-47 Strategic Air Command jet bomber when one of the engines caught fire and began to spray the ship with flame and burning debris. Orders were given to bail out. As I made my way along the catwalk to jump from the nose compartment, I saw the instructor navigator lying unconscious without parachute or oxygen equipment. Everyone else had left the burning plane. I worked my way back to the pilot's compartment. The cockpit canopy was gone, and in the open air, at better than 500 miles an hour, in a temperature of 30 degrees below zero, I regained control of the ship. For an hour and a half, I flew the crippled airplane back toward our home base. On the ground, it was raining and the ceiling was 1,500 feet. With the help of radar, I finally landed the plane with my unconscious passenger. My face and hands were frostbitten and I was temporarily blinded. Two days later, I was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. The story of my flight has been dramatized in a film which will be seen on network television next Monday night. Signed, James Edward Obanoff. So, panel, three fine young men, all claiming to be Lieutenant James E. Obanoff. We'll begin this round of questioning with Kitty Carlisle. Kitty? Thank you, bud. Number one, what an extraordinary story, all of you. Uh, what, at what sound, do, at what speed does sound crack the... No, what you know. What, <laughs> how fast do you go to crack the sound barrier? 760 knots per hour at uh, sea level. Not... Uh, miles, pardon me, miles per hour at sea level. Uh, number two, what program is your television show going to be seen on? The Goodyear Theater next Monday night. Number three, can you tell me what an X-15 is? Uh, yes, it's an experimental rocket ship. Number one, how high were you traveling when the accident occurred? 34,000 feet. Number two, did you have to get oxygen to the navigator at that altitude? No, the navigator had already ejected. The, the fellow you saved. <laughs> He was a didn't navigator he, instructor. Well, how, didn't you have to get him some oxygen? It says he was lying here without any. Oh, I, I came down to a lower altitude so he wouldn't uh, die of anoxia. Oh, I see. What? Tom? Uh, <laughs> an, a number three, how, how high do you have to be before you need oxygen? In a plane, I mean. Not in a... <laughs> Come to think of it, how high do you have to be before you need oxygen? <laughs> Anywhere. 10,000 feet, approximately. <laughs> approximately 10,000 feet? Number two, would you care to comment on that answer? I'd say that's correct. Number one, would you? Oh, approximately, yes. That's liquid measure. Uh, this is a little tricky question. <laughs> you, you fellas don't mind. I'll tell you right now, it's slightly tricky. How many engines? Number one, how many engines does a pylon eight have? Pylon eight? None. Number two? I agree, none. Number three? None. 
Number three, can you tell me what a pylon eight is? No. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. That's number two, what a pylon eight. Betty White, please. I want to know Tom Poston, what's a pylon eight? No. <laughs> number one, what is a pylon eight? I, I really don't know. I think it's some kind of maneuver, but I, I, I don't know. Number two, what's a pylon eight? I don't know. <laughs> Number three, what's a chandelle? A chandelle is a maneuver. Uh, I always thought it was a perfume. <laughs> Five. <laughs> Number one, uh, what is a tour de tape? If you're a ballet dancer, it helps if you can do it. <laughs> it does. Number two, uh, don't you have ejection seats in a, in a B-47? That's right. How come you, you weren't ejected at the time? Uh, there was a mechanical malfunction. Ralph? <laughs> oh, number one, uh, what was your mission? To we're on a routine what? training mission. Uh, in SAC, it's uh, simulated bombing the various cities, and we were on uh, such a mission. Number two, how many were in the crew? There were three in the crew. Uh, number three, what's a due, what does due line mean? Uh, that is... Pray that's it. Time to vote. Wait as long as I could. Just call it a malfunction and let's get on to voting. <laughs> Please mark your ballots, if you will, for number one, number two, or number three. Oh, everybody's pausing on this one. Uh, Not so fast in marking this time. Okay, Betty, for whom did you vote? Well, I'm going to be real obvious this time. The answers out of number two sounded... Nice and nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what about yours, Ralph? The number two. It was a hard toss-up between one and two, but I think number two. Kitty? Well, I'm stupider than you are this time, because you got technical knowledge about pylons, but I didn't think... I thought number two... <laughs> I thought number three had to line, and number two looked like he might have been frostbitten around. I don't know. <laughs> All right, you there on the end who are smarter than two. <laughs> it's either nobody or Bud Palmer. But, but, this is, uh, I have to really, I want number two. I choose number two, but I really must insist that a pylon eight is much too familiar to a flyer. What there is isn't, there hasn't been any uh, fibbing in there, has there anywhere number two? It's a, it's a uh, training uh, uh, turn around a, uh, two pylons. Mm -hmm. It may be the pylon that already bailed out. Okay, there we have it. And uh, <laughs> what's our, our, our voting? <laughs> now, we've got to move along to find out, I'm sure, first of all, that you and I and everybody here would all like to meet the officer who was lying unconscious in that B-47 when Jim Ovenoff uh, brought it down. So here, ladies and gentlemen, is Major Joe Maxwell. Very nice to have you with us, and I wonder if you do us a favor and show us which one of these gentlemen is the one who saved your life. Major Maxwell, you are an instructor navigator, is that correct, sir? That's right. Uh... But it's my job to train young officers as B-47 navigators. Well, let me ask you something. Maybe you can set it straight. A lot of people have been led to believe that now we're in the age of uh, guided missiles and rockets, that such uh, men as navigators and pilots are no longer necessary. Is that true? That's not true, bud. The pilots and the navigators who guide them to the targets are still the backbone of the United States Air Force. Mm -hmm. And through the natural evolutions of the systems, these men will be the ones that will take over and man the spacecraft when they become operational equipment. Mm -hmm. We need more of them, too. Oh, I detect a subtle plea to report if you're interested to your nearest recruiting station. Is that right, sir? That's right. Uh, all right, Major. Thank you very much for being with us tonight, and good luck. Congratulations to you, young man. Let's find out about number one now. Number one, would you, uh, would you tell us who you really are and what you do, please? Well, my name is Roy McKechnie, and I'm the writer for a new comic strip called Tuck, uh, Tuck's Train. Thank you, sir. 
And number two, what about you, sir? My name is Jerry Moore. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, and I work here for the makers of Amoco Gas, the American Oil Company. Thank you very much. And you also garnered all the votes. Well, we see there were four incorrect votes for a total of $1,000, gentlemen. Not bad for an evening's appearance on our show. Hope you had fun. Uh, on your way out, you'll find a carton of Marlboro cigarettes for each of you. Good night and good luck. Thanks for being with us. That's it, except to say uh, to all of you, good night from Marlboro and good night to the panel. Good night. And reminding all of you to tell the truth. Good night, everybody.